when the subject of the environment is raised, people who believe in property rights, people who stand for limited government, and that sort of thing, very carefully, uh, who often seem not to have much to say. And that's a bad thing because the environment is very important and it's been a very high profile issue for about the last half century. Uh, this is quite annoying. <laughs> it seems though every time that thing goes to sleep it loses contact with the uh, projector, which is going to uh, play a hand where the effectiveness of my presentation is considerably because the first thing that I want to show you is this very famous picture taken by uh, Apollo 8, Earthrise. This image of the entire Earth as this beautiful blue marble, spectacular but also very alone in space. And people started to feel that uh, if we were down to our last planet and it was capable of looking that fragile, it might be a good idea if we were to look after it a little better than we had been up to this point. It is just impossible not to think of the environment as important. And this took me to, we're talking about urban sprawl, which is a very effective negative term. And you might say urban sprawl is a phrase meaning uh, people can afford a nice house with a yard. Put it that way, it, it, it's, it sounds a little less threatening. On the other hand, there are very real reasons why the image conjured up by the phrase urban sprawl upsets people. And if you have nothing to say about that other than, well, you shouldn't worry about that kind of thing, then you're going to find yourself at a serious disadvantage in any discussion of public policy matters. Okay, can we do this? There, there that's, that's how the Earth was suddenly seen some 50 years ago. And then another thing that happened the next year, which is, uh, I talk about this in my American history, back to the post-1945. And I start up those classes by telling the students that although I know nothing about them when they come into the class, just about as per individuals, there are two things I can say for you about the entire class. One is that they're anti-racist. They're not just against bigotry. They think bigotry is a major problem and it must be combated vigorously. And they're all environmentalists. And that one of the hardest things they will find about studying the past is to understand that there's a time when people weren't like that. And at one point, one of the things we get to is the Cuyahoga River bursting into flames in uh, Cleveland in 1969. People were going, ah, the river's on fire. It's like, oh yeah, sure, fine, that happens a lot. As a matter of fact, this is not a picture of the 69 fire. Nobody bothered to take a picture in 69. It was just like, yeah, that's the Cuyahoga, you know, that's old news. That's actually the 52 fire, and we've had others. <laughs> like, a lot of them no, no, the river's on fire. You have to do something. And so people decided they had to do something. And this is a, a very major change in the way people thought about things. Like an example of this uh, that is given by Bill Bryson in his superb little short history of nearly everything is to point out that in the international geophysical year of 1957 to 58, the main expressed goal of oceanographers was to think about using the ocean depths for dumping radioactive waste. And this wasn't like an admission, this wasn't something that got found out. This was a boast. You know, try taking a poll on that these days and see if you survive, never mind the idea. And, and we have a different kind of sensibility. I was once watching this program about uh, the oceans, and it, it mentioned when the whaling was thought to be a good way to get oil. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, something like a thousand whales a day were being slaughtered in the waters off Antarctica. And they were rendering the blubber using hundreds of thousands of penguins for fuel. Apparently, he was very fatty. He just chucked it into the furnace and whoosh, up they go. Again, obviously. <laughs> that was then, wasn't it? And it's no good going around saying, but you don't understand the, you know, the thermal properties of the penguins. It's extracting the oil from the dead whale over there. And I'm not just talking about this being an issue from a public relations point of view. You look silly if you have nothing to say about the environment, except there are many, many trees, and this one's coming down. It's in the policy terms. The environment matters to people. The environment matters to people rightly. And so you've got to have something to say about it. And it's tricky in part because not only the environment gained prominence at a time when a lot of issues gained prominence on which the left seemed for one reason or another to have the better of the argument from race to gender. And so they, they kind of come bundled together and people, uh, you know, there are people who think, well, the left has good ideas on some things, the center on others, the right on others, and then we'll, you know, we'll pick and choose our team, we'll have right wingers, centers, and left wingers, as though there are these weird preferences that people have that run this way and good ideas are on that way. 
pick of what you want. Other people who think that principles are important and you have to find out how the world works in order to know what you should do next, would assume that their philosophy has good answers to everything, but the fact is they're easier to find in some areas than others, and the public relations struggle is easier in some areas than others. And uh, this brings me to something Greg Easterbrook, who is a liberal journalist who wrote an iconoclastic book, A Moment on the Earth, about the environment, in which he debunks a lot of the big scares about the environment. But that doesn't mean that he suddenly switched sides in the way that some people seem to have done. He remains a liberal, and one of the things that he said in his book is that the panic mongers are doing us a huge disservice. They're, they're making us misunderstand what's happening. And he said, the first round of environmental investments did not fail. They worked which is a great reason to have more. He's talking about government regulations to improve the environment. I consider this glorious if only because as a political liberal, I long for examples of government action that serves the common good. And so all kinds of people out there think, well, on the environment, the left was right. They wanted to override property rights and pass rules and regulations and restrict people's choices in order to save us all from the Cuyahoga River catching fire and turning that blue marble gray, and a good thing they did. So if you're going to make an effective case for property rights, both intellectually and in public relations terms, you've got to know this argument is out there, and you've got to have something important to say about it. You've got to be able to come up with reasons why that is plausible but mistaken. And that's why I'm here, of course. So again. And in order to do that, I want to make a, a shallow mockery of uh, three great thinkers, starting with John Locke. Those of you who were here last year and didn't learn quickly enough and came back, know that last time I talked in very fundamental terms about Locke's understanding of property rights. That property rights start with self-ownership. The fact that you own yourself, by extension you own your time and effort, and you own the things you make with your time and effort, provided you do not violate the rights of other people in the process. And in this sense, property rights is not a peripheral right. I said property rights is the central right. Property rights is the, is the right to be yourself. And this is not a small thing. I mean, I've met people where it wasn't necessarily that good a thing, but uh, life is a complicated business. And when, when you, even when you hear to talk all day talking about things like well, the importance of you know, religious freedom and freedom of speech and property rights as a bundle, they're not really even, that's not the right way, in my opinion, of looking at it. This core right that you own yourself, that means that you have the right to hear what you choose to listen to. You have the right to rent a hall, put up a notice as long as you don't stick it somewhere that is not yours. Other people have the right to come and hear what is going to be said in that hall, whether it is a church service, a fiery speech in defense of atheism, a boring talk about property rights and the environment, whatever it may be. All these other rights depend upon this core notion that you own yourself. And uh, to me, this is extremely important. And it means no policy can succeed that does not respect property rights. Nothing can reflect the real needs, desires, and dreams of human beings that does not treat them as ends in themselves. It does not respect the individual's right to be them and not who you or I or somebody in public life thinks they should be. I mean, it means practically these policies will fail. If people cannot use their intelligence and energy to improve the world around them, again, all of a sudden you can't use force of fraud on other people because that violates their individuality. But policies based on property rights will work, and they will, they will also work metaphysically, in that they will let people live their dreams. You know, what good is it to say you can build any house you like, and then five minutes later we can knock it down, because we felt that this neighborhood would be, would be improved by the presence of something else, whether that be a heritage building, or a superstore, or oops, all we never went around the building, it's just a field. Whatever they do with it, they have crushed your aspiration for who you wanted to be and where you wanted to be. And so, in that very fundamental sense, property or any, uh, environment or anything else is not going to work if you don't respect John Locke. However, that may well be preaching to the choir here. I think that's what I'm doing. So the second person that I want to corral and drag into the room, and if he were here, he would probably leave again in a hurry, is uh, Garrett Hardin who was a biologist and an overpopulation zealot. Hardin was in many ways an appalling and a dangerous man. But he did us all a great favor in a very famous 1968 paper called The Tragedy of the Commons, where he explained what was going to happen if individuals pursued self-interest 
when property rights were not defined. Now that's not exactly what he set out to do, uh, but he was talking about the old village commons where anybody could pasture their cattle. And he said that naturally what would happen if you had this situation is that it would get overgrazed. So the tragedy of the commons develops in this way. The pasture is open to all. Each herdsman will try to keep as many cattle as possible on the commons. As a rational being, each herdsman seeks to maximize his gain. Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit in a world that is limited. Ruin is the destination towards which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. Freedom of the commons brings you into all, how right he was. But if you believe in property rights, you don't believe in freedom of the commons, do you? You believe in allocating land to people, and they each have their own piece of land on which they may feed their cows but no one else's. And instead of a mad scramble to deplete it before the other guy's cows eat it all, you think rationally in the long run about how to cultivate the land to maximize your wealth over time. This, for instance, is why cows are not threatened and cod are. At least cod in the ocean. We'll come back, we'll come back to our cod later. But the tragedy of the commons is a thing that you encounter any time Resources are not owned, but people are allowed to pursue their self-interest in using them. There are all kinds of places this happens. For instance, why is the rhinoceros threatened? Because poachers can sell a horn to people who, for reasons best known to themselves, if them, believe that it possesses aphrodisiac qualities. You know, and, and if you had your own rhinoceros, and this is what you thought about your rhinoceros, you'd just be stupid. But in a situation where the rhinoceri are not subject to property rights, what you are is a menace to their survival as a species. Because whoever gets to the rhinoceros first, kills it, cuts off its horn, and sells it in a certain part of the world. And nobody is, has any material interest in having rhinoceri persist. You know, I'm not necessarily saying that you should have rhinoceros ranching. I do not know that anyone has ever tried to milk a rhinoceros and lived to tell of it. Uh, and I'm not suggesting either that the world would be satisfactory if we had zoos and ranches full of them, and then everywhere they used to live had been paved. I am not one of these people. I am a great believer in the wilderness. We need it for the good of our souls and our planet. But it is obvious that rhinoceri are threatened with extinction because of the tragedy of the commons. A rush to grab the last one. You gain by killing it, you gain nothing by protecting it. And the same thing, of course, is true of the fish in the sea. Outside of territorial waters or absent appropriate regimes inside territorial waters, Whoever gets the fish gets the money. Whoever doesn't take the fish on the grounds that we're going to need it later after it has reproduced gets nothing, not even the next generation of fish, because somebody else grabs it. And this happens over and over and over again. Now, Garrett Hardin's solution seems to have been to ban the pursuit of self-interest, uh, which, as Stockwell Day pointed out, has been tried enough times that I think we have a verdict on that experiment, and it is not a favorable one. Um, but in, in some sense, everybody knows this. No, Michael Walker, the phrase, used to use the example, suppose you run out with some friends to a restaurant, and you agree beforehand that you'll split the meal evenly. Who's, everybody's going to order something expensive. If you agree that everyone's got to pay for what they ordered, everybody thinks a little bit more about what do they really want and how much money have they got with them. You can generate a tragedy of the commons anywhere, anytime you want, very simply by taking something valuable and getting rid of property rights in it. This is why your, your lawn is not used as a dump, but your air is. It's another tragedy of the commons. Anybody who has something noxious they would like to release can put it off into the air, except when nuisance torts and so on can be uh, a remedy, but that's only when, when it's very limited and pinpoint. But of course, people can't throw things on your lawn because you could prosecute them. So uh, we run into this over and over and over again. Why do municipal water systems leak? Because the water that is expensively collected and treated is not owned by anybody privately while it's going through the pipes. And everybody's business is nobody's business. And uh, you, you see this with roads and traffic congestion. You see this in so many different places that it's almost amazing that it has to be explained, but it does. And it's remarkable that Hardin's first example was, in fact, an environmental example, rather than some more what we might think of as a more easily defensible property position. He did a favor for us all by using the environment as an example. And so therefore we're in a position to say 
in both empirically, because there are all kinds of examples of what happens when government sets out to protect an environmental immunity. One of my favorites is this idea that they would create big artificial coral reefs off the Florida coast by dumping old tires. Government had old tires and it didn't know what to do with them, so it decided that it would be progressive to fill them in the water. Uh, well, fish apparently don't like the tires very much. The government also forgot to tie them down properly, so they started solution around smashing up the coral reefs, and then a very expensive project had to be undertaken to get them out of the water again. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, you know, you rarely go to a private property and find that the owner has done anything this catastrophic. If they have, of course, they are rapidly reduced to penury and must sell their property to someone less idiotic. Governments, on the other hand, uh, respond by expropriating yours. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Garrett Hardin gives an important way of understanding how it is that property rights prevent the tragedy of the commons, and in the absence of property rights, the tragedy of the commons will occur. And it doesn't mean it's always easy to assign property rights. There are situations, including fish, where on the surface of it, it's a little hard to go parceling up the ocean and letting people take pieces of it home. Uh, you know, you can, you can fence a pasture. It is somewhat harder to fence a piece of water. Not that modern technology doesn't give us certain choices that people didn't have in the past, just as it lets us kill all the fish. It also gives us more high-tech ways of, of defining boundaries, but there are, there are other solutions. Um, before I get to that, though, I'm going to I'm going to export uh, Locke back to Hardin because probably not in this year, but but there are a lot of people out there who will object to this notion of property in the environment in any way, shape, or form on a very fundamental level. You say the trick to protecting the environment is to make it valuable, and they go, Oh no, that's commodification. That means we are subjecting nature to a human scale of values. And this is a bad thing to do. Nature is wonderful. Nature has its own morality. And you know, there are all those deep ecologists out there who call human beings a plague on the earth and infection uh, need to be gotten rid of. Like the voluntary extinction movement, which my answer is always that, well, it sounds dangerous, you go first. Um, but leaving those people aside, because there's always a lunatic somewhere and you never know, sometimes they're on your side. Um, <laughs> this line of thinking has put a couple of ideas into much more, more into the mainstream that we need to be aware of and deal with. You know, one of them is the so-called precautionary principle. Somehow oh, that thing got loose. Um, and says we should never do anything unless we're absolutely sure that it's completely safe. And, uh, you know, this is, it, it's weird that this ever became popular because it's so stupid. You never leave your house. Can you prove to me that leaving your house is totally safe? Of course you can. It's not totally safe. One day you'll leave your house and never come back because you'll die. Uh, of course, staying in your house isn't completely safe either because you could die there. Um, <laughs> As uh, Samuel Johnson once said, nothing will ever be attempted if all possible objections must first be overcome. And that is quite literally true. I mean, I'd like to see fire pass the precautionary principle test. Now, do you know how many ways that stuff can hurt you? Um, they can set the river on fire. Um, and also, I mean, another application of the uh, precautionary principle that somebody brought up here um, was the, the idea of burning witches. You know, you don't know that witches are causing crop failure, but you can't prove that they're not, can you? You cannot decisively prove that some strange old woman isn't in league with the devil, so on the precautionary principle, you obviously got to burn her. Well, if fire hasn't passed the test, you have to find something else, some, some safe way of disposing of her. Um, but this, of course, is a ludicrous procedure, and anybody can tell that this is a ludicrous procedure. Uh, on the other hand, if you're going to use tort law and define property rights, then uh, we simply have to go with reasonable standards of evidence, which we can do. You can live in a world with um, reasonable standards of evidence. The other thing that the environmental movement has, has left in the way is uh, the problem of green morality. The difficulty of figuring out if human values are not important, what does make for good and evil? As Greg Easterbrook points out in his book at one point, in Africa, where deserts are encroaching on people, that's a horror. In the American Southwest, where people are encroaching on deserts, that's a horror. Uh, and then there was something to freaking out about the fact that jungle vines are spreading through the Amazon. Apparently, they're choking trees. Um, so Tarzan's vine is an environmental threat. And then this was a story in the Uruguay Citizen. It wound up saying, it suggests mankind is having more impact on delicate ecosystems than previously shown. You know, what it comes down to is this, the notion that in a weird kind of way that all change is bad. 
But you go to some environmentalist and you say, look at the desert. Isn't it incredible how animals make a living in this almost water-free environment? They adapt so cunningly. Oh, it's so beautiful. Say, actually, this was a lush valley until people changed the ecosystem. Ah, it's terrible. It's a desert. Say, like, oh, my mistake. Actually, this was always a desert. Oh, it's just <laughs> <laughs> And, yet, and, and uh, to, to suggest that we can banish human value and somehow substitute nature's values is a dead end because we don't know what nature's value actually is. Um, but it doesn't do to turn around, as some people do, and snarl that man is a part of nature too. I mean, in a sense that is true, but man is a rather odd part of nature. And man can do things to nature, like set the river on fire, that set off your alarm bells. and. Um, I think we all have some innate sense of when nature is flourishing and when it's not. My point about urban sprawl, you want a nice house and a yard. Why do you want a yard? Well, you like to have flowers and maybe a tree and birds and animals. And isn't it a marvelous thing if a deer comes into your backyard? Farmers here are all reaching for their 22s, but everybody else is thinking, yeah, that's great, a deer. And uh, therefore, I uh, was reminded of this idea about nature, you know, nature where every prospect pleases. That, that should be happening somewhere in the world, right? If you were told that all the coral reefs were going to be gone, it would break your heart. And um, only man is vile, right? That's, there's something disquieting about this. And that is even worse. So there are things that, if we turn the whole earth into this, to say we're part of nature would not do. To say there's no such thing as morality outside of human values and we found this efficient would not do. There is something in, in us that needs to protect nature. But that's fine, because with property rights, people do the stuff they want and need to do. And one of the things they need to do is make sure we get at least some of that. This is something people will do, just as if you give a man a house, he will make the house more attractive. Why public housing is so toxic. And when you privatize it, suddenly people start putting up nice curtains. Well, the principle applies on a planetary scale as well. As I mentioned, we, we cannot necessarily uh, parcel up the ocean and take bits of it home with us as we can go to the store and buy tomatoes or indeed fish. But you can do things like assign people a quota of the catch. I mean, at one point, there was, there was one that failed attempt to limit the fishery because they, the fishing boats were getting more and more efficient, and so they kept curtailing the fishing season. You had less and less time out there in the water. So obviously what you had to do was this arms race to get a boat that could grab every fish that ever twitched a fin. And one more, this, I believe this one season got down to 15 minutes. So tweet, foo, and the ocean was emptied. Okay, nice try, but the devil is in the details here. But there are other ways of doing it. To say you can catch so many fish, to think about how many fish there are in total. Um, apparently, Maine lobstermen avoided overfishing for 50 years by dividing up the coastal water into defined territories without any government involvement. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that it can be done, but obviously in the open seas it is not being done well. And again, stop all day can say we'd like to look at Chinese, but among their many other sins, they've apparently been lying to the international authorities with their fish catch, and so people have been estimating based on the catch the health of populations in terms of the Chinese have been deceitful on this point and the oceans are being scraped clean. <coughs> All sorts of dreadful things are happening. There's a huge tragedy in the comments. Now you may think there's still fish. Maybe you ate a fish. Well, if that is true, it's because, and not 2009 was the tipping point, more than half the world's uh, fish uh, that people ate came from fish farms. Who actually are ranching fish. And you know that the environmentalists are having conniptions over this. Uh, Patrick Moore, the Greenpeace Drawbar, it's one of his major pet peeves. And this is such a healthy form of food. It is a whole, one of the keys to combating malnutrition, and yet the, you hear these incredible scare stories about farmed fish. I mean, of course, you can have diseases in farmed fish, you can also have diseases in farmed cows. But you've got people whose livelihood depends upon a healthy fish stock. And that means, human ingenuity being what it is, that they're going to figure this out. You know, the environment environmentalists of a certain stripe are against everything. But Barack Obama one time was doing an interview and a fly pastured him and he nabbed it. Now that was a serious zen moment for the president and not a big fan of his. That was an extra cool. If you ever tried to grab a house fly, you know, he was definitely ready to leave the monastery. Pano <laughs> <laughs> went after him. He was like, how dare you? Um, but there, there are all kinds of people out there who have started to understand 
the importance of getting the methods right in order to protect things that matter. And they recognize how this works in all kinds of areas, and a lot of them recognize it in environmental things too. And uh, Patrick Moore, if you read his book, Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, all the things that he talks about that we need to do in order to protect the environment have to do with good common sense and a robust assignment of property rights to things. Uh, not everybody who comes from Dennis Kucinich, who's a good example of a lunatic in politics, uh, wanted to declare uh, water a human right that cannot be bought or sold for profit. And, and Maud Barlow, I guess, was having a reasonable moment. She said we could have a price conversation if we agreed no profit. So it's okay to sell it as long as nobody has an interest in making sure this gets done right. Well, okay. I there's always somebody. But a lot of people have come around to this, and more and more will, because you do have evidence, and I could cite a ton of it, but it's, uh, time is limited, and so presumably is your patience. Uh, but there are all kinds of ways in which the private sector is helping save the environment. LED is actually one interesting example. Bulbs that use less energy. Never mind those compact fluorescents, which sound like a bad idea until you read what happens you have to do if you break one. You know, evacuate the entire block. And how are we supposed to get rid of these things? If it mercury, the government is making you use light bulbs. That it, and I don't know if children ever break anything. I don't think they do. But if whatever did, a light bulb might be a promising target. And then where would you be? On the other hand, you've got LEDs, um, digital cameras. It's one of the things I'm thinking about as I'm thinking about regulation, things that are regulated and going badly, things that aren't regulated. These smartphones and tablets, and you know, I'm doing my lecture off my iPad here, which is, of course, saving trees as we speak. It's also recording my remarks in case someone should be tempted to misrepresent them later. Um, <laughs> amazingly low impact, and the digital camera. Not that everything needs to be photographed. People photographing their meals and posting them online, right? Human beings can make almost anything into a bad thing. But for all that film that is not being produced, remember the smell of a dark room? Well, the young people in the audience probably won't, but sodium thiosulfate smells like the uh, Cuyahoga River has just about had it. Uh, all that stuff is gone because of private enterprise finding ways to do things. I was also struck by the fact that the um, this is just a story about uh, repainting a road near St. Louis with um, asphalt made from recycled swine manure. And so it is believed to be the first time asphalt has been created from swine manure. Gosh, really? That's, that's thunderstruck to find that. But again, it, here's people turning a waste product into a valuable asset. Why? Because contrary to Monte Carlo, they can make a profit off it. So. There you have, I think, two important parts of the discussion on property rights and environment, but there's one more. Uh, I want to drag Ronald Coase through a burning field of wheat. I do not know if he would care for this treatment, but having passed away earlier this month at the ripe old age of 102, he no longer can hurt me, so I'm going to <laughs> so, Ronald Coase, years ago, wrote a, uh, a paper uh, on the problem of social cost, and it is the most cited law review paper ever, apparently, and Coase feels very strongly that everybody misunderstood him, and he was trying to say the opposite of what people think he was trying to say, and apparently that is true, but too bad, like I said, he's not here, and I am. Uh, what, Coast, what he did is he imagined a world where there were no transaction costs, and then he worked out a, an environmental problem and showed how uh, you would get the optimal outcome regardless of how you originally set the thing up. And then he wanted to say, well, there are transaction costs, and yes, there are transaction costs, but there are reasonably small in many cases, and people are very good at reducing them. That's one of the reasons companies exist. So I'm going to go right ahead and say what Coach should have thought uh, and why I should have had the Nobel Prize instead of him. Uh, essentially, what he came up with was a scenario, we came up with several, but here's one of them, where a, tr a train is running past a wheat field, and the train is emitting sparks, and the sparks may, well, set the wheat field on fire. And he says, okay, suppose that uh, we don't want to have an, un an unjust outcome here. What are we going to do? Who do we, do we punish the train for setting the wheat field on fire? Or do we punish the farmer for this dopey spot for his wheat? And what Coase concluded is absent transaction costs it doesn't matter who you give the rights to in this situation. You're going to get the most efficient outcome, and this is why. 
if you say the farmer has the right not to have his wheat get burned up, and the wheat is more valuable than a spark abatement, that's how economists talk, putting a thing image on the uh, funnel so that it doesn't set the wheat on fire, what will happen? The railway will install a spark shield. If, on the other hand, the spark shield is more fit, expensive than the wheat, they'll burn the field down and they'll pay the farmer. Does it buy his wheat from him as it goes up in flames? If, on the other hand, you say that the train has the right to its sparks, it always has, and the farmer's out of luck, but the wheat is more valuable than the uh, spark shield, the farmer will pay the railway to install a spark shield. Say, hey, here, I don't want my field to burn up. I will actually give you money to do this. If, on the other hand, again, this, uh, the shield is more expensive than the wheat, the farmer's just stuck. So you see, it matters a great deal to the railway and the farmer who gets the rights here. But if the economic efficiency is unaffected. If the wheat is more valuable than the spark shield, the spark shield will get installed either way. The cost will be borne by some different parties. If, on the other hand, the spark shield is more expensive than the wheat, the wheat goes up in flames either way. It's just the railway's loss in one case and the farmer's in the other. Now, why is this important, you're wondering? It's because if you want to have property rights in the environment, you know, it's like the guy who's trying to find double and I wouldn't start from here if I were you. But we are there. We're in a situation where property rights in the environment are, have been suppressed to a degree unusual even given what's happened to property rights in so much of our society. And so you're talking about bringing in fairly dramatic changes in the legal regime and the distribution of property in a society, if you really believe the first two parts of my argument and want to move to the third one. And people are going to worry a great deal that what you're going to do is going to be unfair, that people are going to pay for this, that somebody's going to get hurt. And what the Coase theorem tells you is that provided you assign robust property rights, you're going to get the optimum outcome in terms of efficiency. And efficiency is a word here that includes protecting the environment. Remember, people value the environment. It's a, it's a good, like many other goods, and there are trade-offs, but people want there to be an environment. They want nature protected. They do not want the river on fire. They do not want the magic swamp paved. Uh, as a sideline, for those of you who are fans of J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. You may remember that after going through an extraordinarily epic adventure with the fate of kingdoms in the balance, ends with the hobbits coming back home to their peaceful, bucolic shire and discovering that in the last act of feeble malice, Saruman has cut down the trees and polluted the river. And I always felt as a kid that that was the saddest part of the whole book. And I discovered that it was based on Tolkien's own experience. The fields and meadows where he played as a boy were subjected to housing developments and dismal brick buildings and industrial pollution thanks to the planning authorities, the orcs of brick. <laughs> People don't want this to happen. So they, to them, the environment is valuable. We want efficient outcomes, but meaning proper environmental protection at lowest cost. And because of Ronald Coase, despite his quibbling about transaction costs, we know that if we assign property rights, we're going to get that regardless of who we assign them to. Which means when you are in the process of devising actual regime that does this, you can afford to think about other things like justice. You do not have to have what Kierkegaard called a covetous eye on the outcome. You don't have to be thinking, I've got to give it to the right person because the wrong person will make a dumb decision. No. Individuals pursuing their self-interest will find the maximum value in the use of whatever resource they have, including selling them to someone with a better idea. So, for instance, when it comes to this vexed question of Aboriginal land claims in Canada, you can afford to give a great deal of the Canadian land mass if you think it is just to descendants of people who were here before the Europeans, provided, and that's critical, you give them real property rights. You don't give it all to the chief and say, now it's your house, but he gets to make every important decision about it. You have to really give it to individuals. You can afford, when you're trying to figure out what to do about getting rid of a taking, a restriction on, on land use or something, you can afford to think about justice. You can afford to be fair. You can afford to bend over backwards to be fair, to worry that the marginalized, the excluded, all these kinds of people are not further marginalized and excluded because they don't look to you like the prime entrepreneur on the scene. 
Your problem isn't to pick the winners and losers. Your problem is to get things into private hands. And efficiency will look after itself so you can think about justice. And that is very important because the other side talks a lot about justice. You know, heard the, uh, the, the joke that social justice bears the same relationship to justice that a social worker does to a worker. <laughs> the definition of justice does not always meet the elementary standards one would hope for in such a word. But that doesn't mean that fairness is unimportant. That doesn't mean that you want to defend property rights and limit government by saying, devil take the hindmost, and if the hindmost is never devil take that, that we're going to make a bunch of money here so we don't have to worry about fairness or that silly prettiness. That's completely wrong. That's their caricature of us. And in this particular case, I'm wanting to make a bit of a technical argument why we don't have to be detained by that problem. Because the efficiency of markets with secure property rights looks after itself. Self-interest, when there's no tragedy in the commons, produces maximization of value. And to talk like an economist, and I remind you one more time, and that includes the environment. The environment is a good. The environment is the thing people want. The environment is the thing people protect if you give them the tools to do it. You know, would you rather have a park in the hands of the government that might decide that they should put a light rail stop and some high density development there, or in the hands of a bunch of angry nature lovers who won't let anything happen to it? Well, if you value the park, choose the angry nature lovers. You're not going to invite them over for dinner, but they are going to protect this thing because that's what they do, and it's valuable to them, and they'll buy it if they're allowed to buy it. They may hate it, they may think money is tawdry, but when it comes to buying something or letting it get ruined, they'll buy it. And they can go off and resent that later, that's not my problem or yours. <laughs> and in order to emphasize the, the importance that humans attract to nature, I, it's after lunch, but you've had no chance to digest, otherwise I would not dare to show you this slide. A winner of the um, Ugly Animal Preservation Society, Ugliest Animal Alive Contest. Uh, what's that thing? It's the blobfish, <laughs> described with some justice as looking like a melted human head. Uh, it has other names, um, but they're just as bad down here somewhere. Um, the fathead sculpin or the blob sculpin. Even sculpin is bad. Right? <laughs> when blob gets at it, now it just the whole thing. And the other night I organized the contest. Um, admitted that it had a good contest and that it won. Um, he personally was pulling for something else here, some kind of a, uh, the blue-gray tail dropper slug. Again, you just, you just know this is not going well. Um, other contestants were some, a chubby flightless parrot that was completely awful. Parrots don't really start as that awful. And something called the scrotum frog, which was the less <laughs> said better. But the point of the contest is that the guys in the um, Ugly Animal Preservation Society think too much is made of pandas. The cute animals get all the sympathy and all the votes, but they said we have to preserve ecosystems, we have to appreciate everything. See, this is what people will do who love the environment if they're empowered to do things that are important. They've got to get people to preserve things so revolting that you would flee from the dinner table if it made an appearance. So they set up a contest, they get publicity, it turns into something cute and funny. This is taking us back to John Locke, right? Because this is the creativity of human beings when they are given the power to make positive changes in the world by give, being given the right to things. This is how people respond if you let them to the problem of preserving the environment. They make this into a poster fish. That takes some to, I would not have thought of this. I don't know if you would have thought of this, but they thought of it. It's marvelous. And you can't imagine how hideous it is and then you're gonna go off and post it on Facebook, right? <laughs> This fish will become a huge star, and it is apparently threatened because uh, it's being overfished by people hauling up crop, crabs and lobsters. They don't want the lobfish for reasons obvious and subtle. Apparently, it doesn't taste any better than it looks. But <laughs> it is being killed off because of overfishing, because of a tragedy of the commons, and people need to do something other than complain. Uh, I got a, a mailing some years back from um, Earth Action. And it was about preserving the environment and said, this land is your land. But of course, I looked at it and I thought, well, if only it were. I do actually own a little bit of land and I look after it. I keep things off that would damage it, like environmental authorities. <laughs> uh, I obey the law, but I discourage their more obnoxious meddling. Um, if it's your land, 
you care about it, you'll protect it. If it's your land and you don't care about it, then you will attach a low value to it and you will take an offer for somebody else who cares about it more. And the same thing is true in so many areas. Uh, it occurred to me when I was actually having an appearance with David Suzuki once on the environment uh, that raised consciousness plus a lawyer beats raised consciousness any day. Right, once you've seen the uh, Earthrise shot, you need some effective way of protecting things. And again, you look at the Cuyahoga River. Why is the Cuyahoga River, at the time, it was Time Magazine said it was so polluted it did not flow, it oozed. And it was just filled with industrial toxins. That's why it was capable of catching fire in the event that a stray spark hit, which they did all the time. Why does it look like that? And why are salmon fishing streams in the UK pristine? Because the British streams are privately owned. And the people who own them make money renting the right to go there and catch a sensible, sustainable quantity of fish. There's a classic example of the tragedy of the commerce. If you could privatize a river, you could probably, how do you, when the water keeps moving, right? You can't tell the water to stop. Can Newton do that? Then so do you. But you've got your stretch of the river, and if it starts to get polluted from something upstream, you've got a tort action, right? Property rights, Richard Epstein's six rules for a simple world, and that stream is protected. The blobfish in its habitat is just Garrett Hardin's free for all. So, it is, it can be a challenge. Because people uh, in the middle as well as on the left will say, okay, property rights have their place. We can see there are advantages there. You know, sort of a nice lecture once you're taking care of the basics, but first you've got to protect the environment. Then we'll talk about your precious property rights, about your yacht and your picket fence and your selfishness and your greed. And as long as the argument is framed that way, uh, we're obviously going to be on our back foot here, even if we can prove the balanced budgets be plunging into debt. But people are going to think, yeah, okay, so on some of these grubby necessities, you're right, but on the big spiritual stuff, you're mean, cold, grasping, and wrong. And, you know, that's the wrong sign to wear into the debate, right? Mean, cold, grasping, and wrong. Turn it around. Find something else to write on the back. Like this. To understand that if you empower people, they will be able to make positive change in the world. That's John Locke. If you don't give them property rights, you haven't empowered them, and you will get a tragedy of the commons. That's Garrett Hart. And if you believe you need to empower them, you can afford to make justice your primary concern with distributing rights, because efficiency will look after itself. That's Ronald Coase. And those three are a winning hand in the discussion about the environment and property rights.